Data as Culture Art programme has been going since the very inception of the Open Data Institute with the now legendary fact that Gavin Starks, our CEO's first action as a CEO, was to commission art, which raised a lot of eyebrows. But the thinking is that, of course, um, we, if we're going to be changing the fundamental aspects of society and culture, we need to be inclusive. It needs to be holistic and include artists. Um, next slide, please. Um, and um, this, this year in 2014, could I have the next slide? Thank you. No, that's fine. Back to the other one. Um, Thompson and Craighead, John Thompson and Alison Craighead and Natasha Caruana were our first ever artists in residence. We'd done exhibitions, we'd done projects with other organisations. Um, but this year we wanted to bring artistic practice into the heart of the Open Data Institute. And we didn't look for artists who had already been working with open data. We wanted artists who hadn't worked with open data. So we wanted to bring some really fresh thinking. But the thing about um, Thompson and Craighead and Natasha is that they've all been working with the structures and processes of the internet and exploring network culture in their work for over 20 years. So we felt that they were really well grounded um, as people who might research. So I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves and their practice, um, as well as Dr. Mark Wright from Fat Lab and the University of Liverpool, and um, Alex McLean, who is an artist who's also curated the Creative Lab upstairs, which you must look at. So um, over to uh, Natasha. Hello, um, so I'm Natasha Next, Caruana, please. and I've got the pleasure of being the Art in Residence at the OVI currently, and the show is on at the moment, so do pop down, it's on until December. And my work really looks at this idea of love, betrayal, and fantasy, and I suppose I use data, kind of using the internet as a research tool within this, the slides up at the moment is actually where I began to notice that women were selling their wedding dresses online. And when they were selling their dresses online, they were masking their faces. And I actually created a typology of 202 images where people were putting their, these images online, which would be kind of the trophy image that would be on their mantelpiece. But by obscuring their own faces, you start to notice different things. And you start to kind of use that internet to interrogate you know, the traditions of the wedding day, the, the now performance of the wedding day, where they images are so shown on Facebook. And so the dress becomes like a prop, and then it will be discarded. Um, so I can have the second slide. Also looking at, we had the great thing, the, well not great thing, but the Ashley Madison hack whilst I've been the artist in residence. And that was kind of really timely because one of my works was around married men. And I wanted to look at how the internet is making an impact on the institution of marriage. So through that changing technology, how can people now actually go and date or go and date married people? So I started to date married men, and I dated 80 married men, to actually using the internet, but then going and meeting those men without them knowing and kind of getting that perspective of something that hadn't been seen before. You know, what does the affair look like today? Thanks, Natasha. John Thompson and Alison Craighead, next slide, please. Okay, so we're, we're going to try and introduce our practice in a minute, and uh, with two <laughs> pictures, um, and uh, over to Alison. Okay, so the first picture, which should be behind me, is. is of a short film about war, and uh, this is a video work, it's a two-screen video work, and what we've used is a series of first-hand accounts of war, and it's all information that we've gathered online and it's a method we call desktop documentaries. Uh, and with all everything, all everything we gathered, we tried to use, at that stage, just about 2009, creative common uh, attribute licenses. So, so, so all the still images you can see that are on the left-hand side um, were taken from the Flickr community, offering a kind of collective gaze, uh, and, and all licensed under at attribution license, uh, creative commons. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a more recent work called Stutterer, where we've taken the human genome, or rather the first version uh, of, of the completed human genome, uh, and used it as a kind of musical score uh, to play fragments of television um, that were all broadcast during the period, the 13 years or so, uh, that uh, the human genome, it took people to sequence the first human genome in the first place. So that's about 1990 to 2003. It's an instruction-based work. So on the 
that side, you can see uh, letters T, A, G, C. It's playing from beginning to end, around about 3.2 billion characters. Uh, and each, t each letter, as it comes up, triggers a video uh, chosen at random from a database that says a word beginning with the letter T, A, G, or C, G or C. So things like terrorism, uh, uh, activity, Christianity, God, um, golf. Uh, and it, it, it kind of stays in this sort of flux between things that are very meaningful and kind of meaningless. We worked out it would probably take about, well, it is going to take about 85 years to play from beginning to end. And it only plays once. Um, That's right. Yeah. But, but I have to remind myself that. Only once. Um, uh, but the reason we're showing these two works is because for us, up until coming to be residents here at the Open Data Institute, um, these are two examples of times that we've really thought about open data or about data that should be open. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Mark Wright. Hi. Um, I work between FACT, which is a new media uh, organisation in Liverpool, and Liverpool School of Art and Design at Liverpool John Moores University, where I'm a lecturer in fine art. And that itself is a very exciting model to explore interdisciplinary collaboration between art and academia. Um, my starting point is that the cultural significance of, of the digital is it brings about new forms of embodiment that uh, uh, make new forms of being and identity and thinking and doing come into existence. And so we have a new form of practice that isn't just about creating work on your own or, or throwing technology at something or exploring culture as it, as it, as it is um, at, the, at the moment, but actually performing um, sort of um, uh, interventions into culture and see what unfolds. So this is an example where we have a community of people um, uh, who, who, uh, whose children have um, uh, a need for prosthetics. So we create um, uh, a social technical system that allows them to create these prosthetics from open data on the web using uh, 3D printing, etc. Next, next slide, please. So here's, here's some examples of this kind of uh, work. So we use this thing called Fact Lab, where we bring together art practice, curation, and community engagement together with uh, cross-disciplinary workers from other fields, whether they be academics or whatever, and have a use it as a catalyst in, in which to um, explore culture in a, in a more deeper and rich way. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, if we could hear from you. Um, yeah, I'm Alex. I'm also working across disciplines, um, uh, including uh, music. I work in the School of Music in the University of Leeds, but also choreography, computer science, uh, textiles, um, which is hard to summarise in a minute, but I suppose the thing that connects them all is pattern, which I think of as the um, what's between code and perception. Um, and here you can see... Um, a photo of a performance by me and uh, my friend Matthew Yee King. Uh, we're both live coding, so that's where you write, use uh, programming language as a performance medium. Um, so I'm describing uh, musical patterns using code while my computer is turning them into music, and in this case, when pe while people are dancing to it at an event that's called an algo rave. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> so you can find out more about that by search for our grave. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll do. <laughs> yes, thanks very much. Yep, the last slide, please. So we're just going to have a really interesting conversation now. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to bring, particularly to Natasha, Allison, and um, John, is first I started saying, well, now that you've spent time researching at the Open Data Institute, you've met our networks, you've met our experts, you've done the training, what's the specific unique opportunities that open data creates for artists? And I was quite quickly corrected um, for being a bit literal with that, where everybody on the panel, when I talked to them in advance, you've all said to me, it's more subtle than that. It's more like looking towards open data as best practice. So could you say a bit more about that, John and Alison, first? Um, Yes. Well, it, it's been pretty fantastic actually being at ODI, and we've learned an awful lot during that time. One of the things as we researched open data, and you can see from our brief introduction that we had been considering the Creative Commons uh, as a sort of maybe a place where we could draw material from. Uh, but as we learned more about open data, we began to realize really for us, 
it becomes a kind of critical position, if you like. Um, it's a challenge that's been opened up for people to make a choice whether we work with information that has a kind of level of transparency and accessibility and usability, um, or we can have information that's traded like kind of beans or something. Um, and so what we began to look at was really this kind of position and the challenge and what that kind of uh, maybe means uh, when we use it and present it within the context of an artwork. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that I, I started to think about a lot more was really about the idea of certification as well, uh, which is a, a lot of time is spent uh, thinking about levels of open data and really beginning to get an understanding of this and being really exciting to be really early on at the beginning of something that is equivalent to maybe, like, say, the Soil Association in the 70s. Thank you. Natasha? Uh, well, I feel for me there was a life before open data and a life after, because I think <laughs> now that I'm like in the middle of my residency right now and every day I'm thinking of a new idea and my time is ticking because everything is so inspiring. I think before I was kind of embedded in it, I was, you know, I had that beauty of being an artist and just you can kind of like gravitate and dip in and dip out. And now it's around me so much. I suppose I am thinking more about, you know, why I'm critiquing my own work more than I would have done in the past, where actually was that the ethics that are involved now kind of thinking before when I went to meet those married men and I took photos of them without them knowing and I put that out there kind of as a visualization of what data of what affairs look like today now that I've been amongst the open data and amongst the people there and as you say the certification and the levels of open and closed and shared you know for me it's really I'm not exactly sure where it's actually going to end up um, but it's about, for me, this idea that through the art practice, you can actually look at the edges. And I think looking in those cracks is something which I really like to occupy, where people, of course, you can be open, but then by being open, there's also that, that blurred line. And I think, for me, that's an area that's really fascinating. Thank you. Alex? Um, yeah, I suppose live coding um, openness is the sort of baseline. You have to, uh, if you're doing a live coding performance, you tend to project your code behind you. And code is sort of a kind of data, but a sort of higher order um, kind of data, I suppose. And so it's this whole culture where we don't really talk about openness because it's just what we do. Um, but I don't think that's anything particularly new. I think there's been plenty of, um, well, back to Neolithic times, people making clothes out of um, thread. And when you make um, a piece of fabric with a pattern, that's really um, a sort of digital, discrete a piece of data and you can read it just by looking at it um, and yeah people have always shared information with each other um, I guess now we need licenses but that's only because other kinds of licenses exist and work against us so yeah I, I think of it as something that is just part of our community um, but not something that's explicit but implicit. Yes, and your community is quite unusual in the history of art and the whole notion of sort of original ideas, the amount of sharing and exchange that happens. So, Mark, you're, you're working in a situation where the institution that you're working with is mm. opening itself up in a very unusual way and crashing the barrier between so-called outreach yeah. and uh, exhibition. Yeah, mm. so I, I think the old model of the, the white cube is, is sort of dissolving as well as concepts of, of authorship. And... Um, so, so one thing at the heart of that is what is knowledge and where does knowledge reside? So we normally think in, in the scientific terms of it as being an abstraction that we take out of the world that we can write down as equations or whatever. But there's another form of knowledge which is tacit. So there's the tacit skill uh, of, a, of a, a, a craftsperson or there's the, the knowledge of a community. And this is embedded uh, fundamentally in a way that's very difficult to get at. So you have to have a new practice which actually um, engages in vivo uh, with those communities and creates these new forms of embodiment that I was talking about earlier. Um, and that's how we, we, we get out of that. That's great. So another thing that came up when we were discussing in advance of the panel was the notion of the whole world suddenly becoming an archive and how that creates a whole set of assets, of data, if you like, um, ideas that can be reconfigured and reconsidered. So, um, Natasha, can I ask you to speak to the theme of new forms of narrative, maybe, mm. in this networked world? Um, I suppose new, form, new forms of narrative for me is, I suppose, if I relate it you know, to my practice of the beauty of having 
I suppose the internet as an archive now is that you can create new conversations. You can actually put, you can just you know, shift things such as everybody has an idea of what the wedding day is, this tradition of, you know, you'll get the white dress. And through the internet, we're able to kind of, through, I suppose, a new form of anthropology, that's how I kind of see myself, this idea of the anthropology of actually studying people. You know, they're putting their images out there and this level of me collecting those images, so kind of appropriating those images and representing those images. I would never have been able to have access of those photographs. I would never be able to create a document of between 2011, between 2013, that moment where people were masking their own faces on their wedding, wedding images, which became because of Kate and Will's wedding. So because of the pressure of the marriage and the wedding today that you can be a princess too at that particular point, women were spending too much money on their dress and then they were recouping it afterwards. And th only through the internet are you able to get that amazing position, amazing access to those narratives in people's homes and they're putting them out there, and you can represent them to an audience to get them to rethink such big themes as the wedding day. So being authors of new stories about ourselves. Mm. Alison and John, do you want to say something? Because narrative's really central to your work, and all, that's always been a running theme, the way you've looked at how the network changes that. Yeah, I mean, I think we've always been really interested in trying to pull narratives from the web, isn't it? That's always been a string. So I think quite early on, we did a work called... Um, um, a short, a short film about flying, which really set us on to making something a little bit more substantial um, called a short film about war. And I think um, for us, we just really wanted to be able to have the conversations with people or to under, have a first-hand accounts of war, mainly um, through accidentally uh, being stuck on a plane with a, a soldier who was uh, coming back. And actually, just having that first-hand account made me want to have more first-hand accounts of war. I, I think um, with the short film about war as an example, it's a two-screen work. And what we're interested in is finding things that exist out there already and thinking about our agency as artists as how we stitch this material together and also how it's mediated, how it's kind of transmitted from one place to another. Like Natasha, I would say we both think of ourselves as participant observers in that kind of anthropological sense. So we are putting stuff out there as well. Uh, but with the short film about war, we present the same information simultaneously on two screens, but in different forms. So on the left, you have this kind of these still images, voiceovers coming from blogs and a soundtrack. This kind of constructed, almost fictionalization of these real experiences. And then on the right-hand side, there's just a text dump. It's just all the URLs, it's all the locations, it's all the GPS of everything that comprises that. Um, what you're seeing kind of constructed on the left-hand side. So the viewer's left in a kind of flux of sorts where you're seeing the same thing at the same time and one's kind of pitted against the other and perhaps undermining the other. And maybe you can kind of think through watching that about how things become to mean things and how things become meaningful, um, even when they come from disparate sources and distributed networks. Mark. Yeah, there's, there's a famous essay called Walking the City by Michel Dusseteau where he talks about the invisible people through walking through the city as invisible authors that don't even know that they're authors. And what I think open data does and the digital does is it makes those, um, makes visible those authors and, and, and um, makes them aware of their creativity. So, and I was looking at... Um, some of my work involves uh, James Joyce and Ulysses, and he used um, um, what I think of as the second state of language after the spoken word, which was the written word. He used uh, documents about Dublin to create his amazing, um, his amazing uh, flights of fancy and these multiple nonlinear narratives. But what we have now is the third state of language, which is the algorithm. Code is language which does stuff. And so we have this, this more fluid concept of language, which gives us this uh, much bigger space of what narrative is. That's a great lead to give Alex the last yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suppose I just can make a quick abstract point about, um, which follows from that, I think, about um, timelessness of data, that um, you can kind of step out of the pervasive narrative of progress um, and, yeah, think about things in more cyclic um, ways, look at historical data and um, yeah and, and stop thinking so much about growth um, but more about reflection.
Thank you so much. So <laughs> I hope we've had a little bit of an insight to the artists as the original code breakers, the people who sort of shake it up and work between the cracks and see things differently. And thank you all so much. And please talk to us afterwards because we don't have time for questions. Thank you. <laughs>